bring over Chanel. Chanel, like number five. She smells as good. She is, I won't share her story because, but she is part of that school board monstrosity. And she has been fighting for a long time. Come over here, dear. Stand on the truck. This, uh, that's not guaranteed. This is a fringe stage, guys. All right? So we're just got to do what we can. All right? Uh, next next one, we'll get Jordan Peterson to fund it, and we'll get a $10,000 stage. All right, Jordan? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> can you hear me okay back there? A few years ago, uh, while I worked as a high school teacher, I led the Pride Club. I remember discussing with students uh, how we could promote inclusion at school. Should we make some posters? Should we uh, organize a fun activity? I didn't see any reason someone would oppose this kind of thing unless they were ignorant or intolerant. My thinking was that it would positively affect that group of kids and it would not have any negative impact on anyone else, so why not? When George Floyd died, I sported a Black Lives Matter pro profile picture for some time. It seemed to be the right thing to do and I imagine this was helping us achieve a, a more just society in some way. Ironically enough, it was my criticism of BLM or of critical race theory more broadly that led to me being, being investigated by my school board not even a year later. A teacher in a private Facebook group made a post asking others to share BLM resources and I objected to the idea defending neutrality in the classroom. One teacher who didn't know me and had never interacted with me complained. The next day at school, uh, I was handed a letter informing me that my board was investigating me. When that concluded in March 2021, I was suspended for one week without pay. Then in March 2022, I got notice from the Ontario College of Teachers that they also were going to investigate me for these two comments I'd made over a year prior. I'm still waiting for all that to be done. I still find it difficult to understand, let alone explain, in some coherent way how my worldview shifted sometime in 2020, but I can say with certainty that Jordan Peterson did have something to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> it might sound crazy and probably also familiar to some, but throughout my six years in university, I never once got exposed to a single intelligent voice with a dissenting opinion on social justice ideology. Everyone around me agreed with it, or at minimum, they went along. How nice it would have been to hear the other, what the other side had to say, uh, instead of being presented with ugly caricatures. To have a professor like Peterson, who spoke up despite the climate of political correctness and fear. I actually remember feeling uncomfortable with the prevailing ideas at the time. Uh, at various times, I like when I took a women's studies course and I felt like the teacher was pushing her views on everyone, or uh, when, when I saw that people I had once aligned with were acting like bullies uh, in the name of inclusion. Sorry, one second. I, I need my myths. I'm patriotic, but I have no tolerance for the cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When I finally came across people like Joe Rogan, Gad Saad, James Lindsay, and Jordan Peterson in the summer of 2020, it was a complete breakthrough for me. Never before had I felt such intellectual curiosity. I must have read books and listened to podcasts for perhaps close to eight hours a day that summer. It, it was the beginning of COVID, like I do, I do have friends. <laughs> I, I think the, the first thing Peterson taught me, and I believe this is actually fundamental to uh, my awakening, if you will, is that I should be immensely grateful for the miracle of the West and the miracle of our institutions, even though they're not perfect. The fact that we have access to food and water 
and that we can coexist peacefully with others is an anomaly, historically speaking. And it is not guaranteed to last. I started to understand too that I was a part of these systems and with that came a responsibility to not blindly destroy them but to contribute to them, to, to try to keep them functional. This meant doing my part to keep them aligned with fundamental principles of a free and democratic society like uh, free speech, equality and truth. So I decided I had to speak the truth, even when it was unpopular, which turned out to be pretty much all the time. Uh, <laughs> I allowed myself to have faith in the process. I decided that no matter where speaking the truth led me, I would face it voluntarily and not live my life as a coward. Anything, anything was better than selling my soul and not speaking when I had something to say because I know where that leads. Whether we're talking about the Holocaust or the gulags in the Soviet Union, historically his atrocities have occurred largely because not enough people have stood up and spoken their minds. They were too afraid, which allowed for very bad ideas to propagate and also reinforce this tribalistic nature of ours, the us versus them mindset. The Nazis didn't just come out one day with murderous plans to exterminate the Jews. It, it was a long process, it started small. The Jews were increasingly linked to monetary power and seen as wanting world domination. Then they were blamed for the World War I defeat in Germany and the prejudice they faced got worse and worse incrementally. In a time of economic collapse after the war, people were seeking hope and safety. The Nazis capitalized on the prevailing prejudice to get into power and their ideas grew increasingly radical. At one time, you might have faced job loss or been ostracized for being a Jew or, or for defending Jews. Uh, so many stayed quiet. And years later, you faced uh, an unspeakable suffering and death. Why didn't people speak up when they knew it was wrong in the early stages? The same can be asked of people today. Having white skin is now supposed to mean someone is guilty of some kind of original sin. Colorblindness is racist. Children are being sterilized and mutilated in the name of gender-affirming care. Women are losing their rights to single-sex spaces. And even speaking the truth about the leading cause of death in our residential schools, which was tuberculosis, is enough to get a teacher suspended. And I'd like to give a, a shout out to uh, my teacher friend, Jim McMurtry, who's out in BC and he's su suspended right now. In North Korea, they did <laughs> Not yet, soon. Two more paragraphs. Uh, <laughs> In North Korea, they divided the population based on land ownership. Not from one day to the next, but after years and years of increasing resentment for those who were better off. Most of the people had good intentions. They strived for equity. It was seen as unfair that certain people were better off than others. Wasn't everyone entitled to the same outcome? They were eventually divided into groups based on not only uh, whether they had land, but whether their ancestors had land and how loyal they were to the government. Individual rights were disregarded because group identity had become paramount. Look where that country is today, living in unimaginable poverty with no freedom whatsoever. The road to hell can very easily be paved with good intentions. In Venezuela, it was the poor versus the rich that led to collapse. Resentment and polarization grew over years and years, and having money increasingly indicated moral failure. A politician came in and tapped into that with promises of wealth distribution and equity for all. That is not what happened. Today, 95% of Venezuelans live in absolute poverty and in just abysmal conditions. In Canada today, it is just a different version of the same story. Narratives about the world being made up of the oppressors and the oppressed based on your race, your sexuality, and your gender. 
this time have been rapidly gaining traction and many are terrified to speak up. I want to suggest to you though that not speaking up might, might be actually more dangerous than speaking up in the long run. Yeah! We need an army of truth tellers like Jordan Peterson who will not only stand up for him and support him anonymously, but who will stand proudly and tell the truth in their own lives. I believe the future of our country depends on it, actually. And I hope the College of Psychologists will recognize that attempts to control Jordan Peterson's speech with threats to revoke his license for voicing his opinions is wrong. There is no democracy without dissent. Thank you for listening.